Roll up, roll up. The carnival is coming. Hey everybody and welcome to the first Wrestle Carnival interview. It's Kurt from the Kurt Johansson Show and I'm here with the two commentators signed to Wrestle Carnival. We've got Dave Bradshaw, we've got James R. Kennedy. Guys, thank you for joining. Very welcome. Yeah, thanks so, for having us. So everybody's really excited from the news that you two have signed with Wrestle Carnival. I know Gary had been posting it everywhere and Everybody's been saying you're one of the favourite duos of British wrestling from your time in Defiant and What Culture Pro Wrestling. But there's some people that may not be too familiar, so we're going to let them know who are going to be the voices of Wrestle Carnival going forward. Um, so, Dave, we'll start with yourself. Like, how did you get into the crazy world of professional wrestling and telling all this, doing the storytelling behind all these matches? Oh man, um, well I've been a fan since I was eight. I guess so. That's early. I'm telling you how old I am now, but early '90s. So I'm 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 a child of the Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, Randy Savage era of WWF, and I was at uh, at SummerSlam at Wembley in '92. Um, so that was uh, a crucial part of my uh, formative years. And then um, um, I I briefly trained actually to be a wrestler like in 2002 for like six weeks. And then realized that uh, I am absolutely not cut out to do that. So, um, uh, but I made I, I met quite a lot of uh, you know people who are still friends now from that. Like Zack Saber Jr. went to the same uh, gym I went to. So I first met him when I was like I don't know I was 18 and he was 14 or something. And you know we've stayed friends. So it's interesting who you meet just from these very short um, you know encounters too. But then anyway, I went to university, did student radio. Uh, and then, you know, had sort of a broadcast experience under my belt, I guess. I did some football commentary at uni. Um, and then uh, once I was out of uni, I sort of thought, right, how can I keep doing broadcasting uh, if, other than as a full-time career, which I wasn't sure if I wanted to do or not. And then, um, you know, I got into, uh, I thought, well, wrestling would be cool. So I um, found, a, you know, a nearby promoter from where I was in London and, you um, said, you know, do you need a commentator? He's like, well, not yet, but, you know, I kept on then going to his shows and pestering him. Um, and uh, eventually they gave me an audition and, and I started commenting. And the rest is history. Like, again, you've become one of the voices. So many different companies um, were your voices behind it. Uh, James, how did you get, like, started in wrestling? Well, I don't have a cool... I didn't go to SummerSlam 1992. Um <laughs> So I don't have, Dave has kind of trumped me there. I don't have a cool story <laughs> like that. Um, I didn't actually get to go to a wrestling show until around 2001 or 2002. Um, and it wasn't even a big time show. It was a, a WWF tribute show in my local town hall and Earthquake won a Royal Rumble. And that's pretty much all anyone remembers <laughs> from that show. Um, pretty much almost the same as Dave. Been fascinated with wrestling ever since I was a kid. Um, I've been writing about it ever since I was a child as well, and I'm lucky enough to now do that full time for a living for a website called whatculture.com. Um, I've been writing for FSM magazine as well, and I've done other bits and bobs for various other places. Um, pretty much always been obsessed with it. In terms of how I got involved in the wacky world of professional wrestling as a manager, first and foremost, I was really just cheeky, um, and I emailed the right people at the right time. It's one of those kind of boring stories that I could make a lot more entertaining. But the long and short of it is I sent a Facebook DM. Someone replied. I went to a training school and much like Dave decided that actually wrestling wasn't for me. It hurt too much. Um, so I thought I'll become a manager. Bobby Heenan was always my hero. Guys like that, Jim Cornette. Yeah. And that seemed like a pretty good way to get involved. Um, as for the commentary... Again, Dave will tell you it was just annoying and pestering the right people. Um, I was still a manager for What Culture Pro Wrestling at the time, and I actually turned up to a show. Um, we were on a, it wasn't a tour as such, but we were maybe doing two or three shows back to back. Yeah. I turned up to one of the shows, didn't have anything to do in that show, and you didn't have anything to do. 
And um, so I asked the promoter, well, I think I actually asked you, Dave, I think I said to you, you know, what's the chances of me maybe commentating a match? Because I was involved in a feud with this tag team who were wrestling on the card. And I thought maybe I could get involved that way. I've always wanted to do it. Um, and I said, I said, don't ever talk to me again. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, Dave throws this, it's a hell of an uppercut, I tell you. Um, and I'd heard about that, you know, he, he plays himself down a little bit there when he says, you know, I tried out for wrestling. I decided <laughs> it wasn't for me. The guy could be, pff, I don't know, UFC light heavyweight champion. Anyway. Um, I appreciate the light there. That was <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, pretty much Cheek just asked Dave if he thought it was possible. And he very kindly said, you know, Matt Stryker was on that show as well. Dave was doing commentary with him. Um, and Dave said, you know, I'll step out if you want to step in. I don't mind. Um, and that was a rare time that Dave didn't have an ego, you know. And, uh, oh, I'm getting the digs in early, Dave. You're yeah. going to come back at me with something. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't worry, I'm storing them up. Yeah, I could tell. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that, that was pretty much it. Dave was kind enough to, to step out for that one match. Um, and then, again, long story short, after that, they needed someone to work with Dave, and I was the lucky one chosen um, we happened to do very well together on the first show, and then it ju they just decided to run with it. We realised that we had pretty good chemistry together, um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun, and it's the best decision I've ever made. I prefer commentary so much more than I ever did managing. <laughs> no, that's great. I was going to ask, like, what was that first experience like then? Because it's so well and good thinking. I can commentate. You might have sat at home just trying to comment along to whatever you're watching on the show, but then to be in front of the crowd, there's no retakes. And for yourself, James, making your commentary debut alongside Matt Stryker, what was that like? It was very nerve-wracking. Very, very nerve-wracking. Um, I would say, though, in, a, in an odd way, that I was a lot more... I think because it was only one match, I knew it was just one match. It was a 10-minute yeah. match. And I knew if I sucked then and there... You know, that it wouldn't be a big deal. I, I kind of had this weird premonition that I would get another chance yeah. somewhere. It was just what was happening in the company at the time. Um, so I just had fun with it. it. It was easy from a standpoint of I was involved with the two of the wrestlers in the tag match. I was in a feud with them. So whenever Striker threw to me, I always had something to say. Um, I knew it was going to be a bit more challenging when I did a full show. And that proved to be correct. But to Dave's credit, he was very patient with me and led me through it. So um, it was it was oddly smooth, I would say, the transition from uh, managing into commentary. But that's because I had good people around me. Wow. Is that the first ever compliment, especially on air, that you've given Dave? Yeah. I feel a bit sick. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, he, he has been asking me for money throughout lockdown. So... <laughs> I think uh, this is probably just at the latest cloy. But, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting I'll it take, either. I'll take the compliment. We'll go with it. <laughs> well, I'm honoured to um, like host the first compliment from James R. Kennedy to Dave Bradshaw. So, Dave, what about yourself then? Like, What was your first like experience of, again, being behind the desk commentating one of the shows? Because, again, for both of you, whether it's 20, 30, 40 people in a hall or you've done it in front of thousands... What's that been like for you? Um, I mean, mine was in 2008, and so that was, you know, prior to what we would call the the, the boom period of the 2010s. So this was in some uh, small civic hall in Bromley, South London, uh, with about 100 people. Um, and I was commentating with a guy called Dean Ayers, who's a very successful and experienced commentator. Uh, and the first thing he did was was when it when I was backstage um you know back in the locker room kind of area was to um he, t he said to me right when you're backstage at a wrestling show you shake everyone's hand upon arrival and you shake everyone's hand when you leave and I was like are you ribbing me is that like a is that a real thing like uh he's like yeah 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 and it is and so that that's that's a, a you know that's a minefield to navigate to start with yeah. you know, first time you do that like you're like okay man who, who, there's a lot of people at wrestling shows as well like backstage yeah. you don't realize like you know a lot of people who you know many of them may be important members of the crew like ring crew or camera or whatever some people are just like someone's partner or you know and they're just there and it's like man i can't remember who all these people are and who i've shaken hands with and who i haven't but um uh but yeah so that was interesting and then yeah the first show i did um was was 
fine, I think. I don't have a DVD of it. The second show I did was um, was over in Wolverhampton, and it was had some Ring of Honor guys on it. It was quite a big show, and I got um, put on it at sort of short notice, about two days' notice. And you know, oh, you want to come to Wolverhampton this weekend? Daniel Bryant or Brian Danielson's going to be there, and Austin Aries and Tyler Black and the Briscoes. I was like, yeah, okay. Like you know, and so that was pretty. Thrown yeah. in the deep end. No wracking. Yeah, but I mean, I, I guess I didn't have the luxury that uh, that James had. You know, my, my first one wasn't ten minutes; it was like a three-hour show. But at least it wasn't live. You know, in those days, we weren't really streaming yeah. live pay-per-views, so it was like it was you know four matches, an interval, then three matches, and it was coming out two months later on a DVD. So if it was dreadful, they could edit it to make it uh, make it sound a bit better. Yeah. Well, with you saying that, obviously you'd have done the um, commentary in a studio, for example, with um, NGW, which I know you'd been the voice of, that'd be recorded, and then it'd be like the voiceovers, or you may actually be in live attendance recording, or if you've got a live pay-per-view, like for both of you, like what's the difference with that? Like how do you prepare? Is Do you feel a bit more of a, say, anxiety if it's a live pay-per-view? Um, I would say... Yes, if it's live, um, but it's also much more fun. Yeah, I, I would far rather commentate in front of a crowd, you know, in front of the action, rather than do it in a studio just yelling at a TV screen, which is which is an odd thing to do when you start doing it. You know, you learn to do it, but it's like it just feels like you know when you're just screaming into the silence, it just kind of uh, <laughs> it feels like you know it feels like you're just an overexcited television viewer. Surely that's every day for you, Dave. Just screaming endlessly into the void. Into the void. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. Whenever I yeah, whenever I think about how I've become associated with James R. Kennedy, it's yeah, constantly screaming into the void. But no, it's um, yeah, it's it's, it's a lot different. It's more nerve wracking, obviously, in front of a live crowd. It's much more fun as well. So it's you know, um, pros and cons, I would guess. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't really have my first studio commentary um, experience up until very recently for a company up here in Scotland called ICW. And it was very strange, very, very strange, because as Dave says, I was in someone's bedroom for a start, <laughs> so there's no natural ambience at all. Um, and we actually, we couldn't have the volume on the TV. So there's even less atmosphere going on. I believe the only atmosphere we had was a screaming baby upstairs. Um, and that was pretty much all we had in terms of background noise which wasn't helpful either, but yeah, I agree with Dave. I would say that some of the toughest shows that I've done so far have actually been the pre-taped ones. And I don't know if there's just this kind of cliched thing about going live and it just brings out the best in you or something yeah. like that. Um, but whenever it's pre-taped, I always found that it knocked a little bit of edge off. Now, it was easier with Dave because as I said earlier on, we developed chemistry pretty early on and um, so we always had something to fall back on if you like we always had you know we could argue about this we could bicker about that there was always something to talk about but I did find that when it was pre-taped it was more pressure on me for some odd reason live I just prefer it so much more but saying that I just love doing wrestling commentary now so I'll take it whichever way it comes <laughs> If somebody's listening and they're thinking, I want to be involved in um, professional wrestling, but like yourselves, I've tried it and thought, the in-ring side's not for me, and they've got potentially the voice or the charisma to have a role as either a manager or a commentator. Um, Dave, we'll start with you. Like, What advice would you give somebody um, that's thinking of getting into this crazy world? Um, first, I would say know what you want to be or know who you like. This is sound really. I thought you was going to say no, don't do it. No, no, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, this will sound corny, but know who you are, right? So, you know, everyone thinks, oh, I want to get into wrestling. Cool, I'll go wrestling training, right? Well, I don't have an athletic bone in my body. And if I would, if I was being honest with myself when I was 18 and went to wrestling school for six weeks, then I would have known, you know what? I, I can't even, I'm not, even, I'm not in shape. I can't do this you know um but but a few years later when i came back to the idea of working in wrestling by then i'd done radio and i was like not only did i know by the time i by the time i sort of started getting in contact with promotions about commentary not only did i know that i the thing i wanted to do in wrestling was commentate but i knew that that i would be better doing play-by-play -play than color because you know 
and again, not not necessarily just because I'd had loads of experience doing radio, but just because by then you know sort of uh, what your personality is like, what role you take tend to take when you're doing a broadcast. Like you, you know, I know that I like to be the guy who moves stuff along. I like to be in control of what's happening. You know. Uh, which is, you know, maybe my psychotherapist can say some words about, but like, you know, but it it, it means that, I, and I I'm, I'm a bit more, um, I guess uh, I'm more more tending towards kind of a serious tone than a than a jokey heel, you know, bad guy tone. And actually, I think it would be, you know, I think it would be really difficult for me. Like, I, I if if someone said, right, can you go out and do color and be a heel, I'd be like because uh, you have to be funny like you know regularly come up with these like one-liners whereas like at least with play-by-play if I don't you know if, if I can't think of anything witty to say in response to whatever the idiot sitting next to me is uh, is, is saying then I can you know I can at least revert to calling the moves that are happening you know so it and then I know equally though that a lot of color guys say the same about play-by-play that they would find it very hard so I think it's about knowing uh, what you know, being honest about what your skill set is, what you would be best at, and even including aesthetically, by the way, because there's, yeah. there's like, you know, if you're, um, if you're naturally, you know, if, even if you want to be a wrestler rather than a commentator, I'm not saying don't do it, but if you're five foot two and you weigh a hundred pounds, then you're going to train to be a very different wrestler. You know, you can't go, oh, I want to be Goldberg. You know, <laughs> you're, you're going to have to, maybe you're gonna Gilberg. Have, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're going to have to, you know, think, okay, with my body type, with the sort of you know things I want to do, like what what can I contribute to the wrestling industry? And so it, you do need to be pretty clear about who you yeah who you are before you start thinking where you might fit into that puzzle. I think. Yeah. How about yourself, Jim? I would say just as an extension of what I said earlier on, and you know I can only go based on what worked for me. And I've you know growing up, I was always quite a shy teenager I was very yeah I was never the kid who would speak first or speak loudest or anything of the sort I was happier in the background but I think you know if you're passionate about something it's going to push you out of that comfort zone naturally and you might take risks that you otherwise you know sometimes when I look back on the messages that I sent and how ballsy they were about getting involved in wrestling or maybe writing for magazines and stuff I'm terrified when I read them back because I know the person I was at that time. So I think you just have to, you know, you have to gauge your passion for it. How badly do you want this? Because I think wrestling attracts that kind of person, doesn't deflect that kind of person. It will welcome passion. Um, And if you, you know, show a little bit of initiative and a little bit of self-confidence as well, it can be hard. But if you just push yourself out there, um, even if you're shaking like a leaf and you're nervous like I was, good things can happen and you can look back proudly on those those moments. So sometimes it's better just to get stuck in rather than think, you know, what if or, or make an excuse or something like that. What Dave's saying as well about knowing who you are um, and having a very clearly defined idea of what you want to be is very important as well. And um, one thing I've been very careful of, with few exceptions really, um, certainly when working with Dave as well is trying to, you know, extend beyond the boundaries of what my character is. Um, Sometimes I think I've done it by accident and either I've realized or Dave's pulled me aside and gave me some feedback um, and then gave me one of those uppercuts that I spoke about earlier on. Feedback's a nice way of putting it. Feedback, yeah, by (laughs) breaking my jaw. But anyway, you know, feedback is feedback. Um, But yeah, just try and be a very clearly defined character. I think that's an, an easier way to do it rather than, as Dave says, trying to, you know, stretch beyond your limits or try to be Goldberg, which was, you know, there's someone out there, Dave, who is maybe four foot 11 or something like that and weighs about 90 pounds. And it's their dream. They've shaved their head, they've grown the goatee and it's their dream to be Goldberg and you've just crushed feel, that feel- dream. You know what? It's not. You know what? You're right. It's not for me to tell anyone. If you want to swim against the tide, swim against the tide. I'm just saying you'll get where you're going a lot faster if you go the way the water is going. It's true. Or move to Mexico and be in the mini division. There well, you go. There you go. Perfect. There you go. Sorted. <laughs> so, James, what's like again with ICW with Defiant? You've called so many great moments. Um, I 
obviously on your Twitter, you mentioned calling the Lionhearts last match. Um, um, what are like some of your proudest moments and ones where the fan kind of takes over as well? Because obviously you've got to be professional, you keep it in character, but sometimes you get a match just so good, especially when it is live and you're not in the studio and you're getting um, like brought in in the atmosphere and the adrenaline's kicked in. What matches can you recall of where you've just been in awe and that fans come out? Well, first and foremost, one of the first that springs to mind instantly is um, there was a feud between Martin Kirby and Joe Hendry uh, in WCPW slash Defiant. It went on for a long, long time. It was a great feud. Um, really, really good. Based on Joe Hendry was in a group called The Prestige. And Martin Kirby ended up with a concussion, wanted revenge. So naturally, you had this story. As Dave said earlier on, he likes to play this serious play-by-play guy. Um, and it's, it's you know, it works for him. But with Martin Kirby, who at first, Dave, if you recall, was actually, you know, get, getting on your nerves, shall we say. And then because of the natural curve of the story, you actually started to come round on him um, because of the, the villainous, vile actions of Joe Hendry. And I remember they had, uh, I can't just narrow it down to one because they had several great matches. Um, and it was just a lot of fun just to always poke the bear when it came to Dave. You know, I, I had a great time coming up with saying things that I just knew would get on his nerves <laughs> and I knew would pull the best. You know, we were having so much fun with it. Um, and I remember Joe Hendry actually saying to me afterwards that, you know, he felt that the commentary actually enhanced the match. And I think that was the first time a wrestler ever said that to me. Oh, and wow. that was a huge moment for me personally because... I was terrified when I started doing commentary of actually taking away from the product yeah. or ruining someone's match or saying the wrong thing or stepping on Dave's toes or, or doing anything, um, you know, that was out of sorts that would ruin the overall atmosphere. So to have a wrestler that I respected tell me that what Dave and I did collectively enhanced the match was a, a huge, huge moment for me personally. Obviously, the Lionheart one has a lot of, um, I use that word again, a lot of a, it's, it's very personal um, because of what happened after that um, in his life. Um, very tragic circumstances, very, very sad, obviously. Um, so to call his big moment, which had been building for years and years and years, was just a real treat. Um, and to do it in front of thousands of people who were sharing in that moment as well. Um, I think there, there were around maybe two and a half to three thousand people in the hydro that night. But as far as I was concerned at ringside, it was 90,000 people and it was WrestleMania because the atmosphere was electric um, and I just got such a buzz from doing that. Um, a third moment, if you'll indulge me, is a yeah, rather yeah. weird one okay. um, because I was a fish out of water completely with this one. Um, Dave will recall the majesty of the, the Pro Wrestling World Cup um, and specifically the Japanese qualifiers for the Pro Wrestling World Cup. Now, if anyone knows me, they know that I'm very much a, a storyline guy, a character guy. Yeah. Um, and I do watch some Japanese wrestling, but usually just the big annual Tokyo Dome shows. I don't follow it religiously. So some of these guys, I wasn't so certain exactly who they were. Um, and it was a completely different style of commentary. I've likened it, and I know Dave has as well, to snooker commentary, <laughs> because these guys were on the mat a lot. Um, there wasn't necessarily a feud or a story going into every match. So, you know, I couldn't just rely on that heel shtick that I pretty much rely on 99% of the time. Um, so that was a, a real eye-opener for me because it taught me so much in such a short space of time that sometimes, you know, I couldn't just be that bombastic over-the-top heel. Sometimes I had to sit out and let Dave take the majority of what was happening in the ring and then just gauge when I could step in. So it was a real eye-opening experience for me, but a really valuable one as well. Yeah, I'd, I remember the show you're on about, actually. I think it would have been in Manchester. Um, yep. I remember going and watching, and I think a lot of the audience was a bit like yourself and not too familiar with um, Japanese wrestling because it was either show or yo they was having their match, but everybody mm -hmm. was chanting for the opposite one that wasn't <laughs> involved in the match. And then when that was, when the other's match hadn't ended up happening and they came down, the energy just went out of the room and it was like, 
oh shit, we've just been chatting to the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> I was probably doing the same old commentary, to be honest with you. Um, what, was it that show that had Ishii and Rampage? Yeah, that, I think that would be, Dave. Is that right? Yeah, it might be. Yeah, on, on the Japanese qualifiers. Yeah. Yeah, I think maybe it was. It's yeah. the main event. Like, the w- reason I hesitate, we had so many, like, the World Cup was so cool. We had, like, you know, we had, there were eight different qualifying tournaments. You know, yeah. one for Japan, one for Mexico, one for USA, uh, Germany. And then, uh, and then you know, we had a round of 16 quarterfinals, semis and a final, all within five days of each other in, uh, actually, it was, must have been August 17, yeah. right? about three years ago. And, um, you know, it all was just like this incredible 64-man knockout thing that took place over a pretty short period of time, really, considering. And it's just like the whole thing's a blur. I, I keep forgetting, you know, some, even some of the matchups that happened, which were like yeah. dream matches and were some of my favorite ones. Sometimes I look back at the, you know, results list from those shows. I was like, oh, my God, I forgot that <laughs> match happened and was epic, you know. Um so yeah, I mean that's uh, you know if we're talking about favorite favorite experiences in wrestling, then that that tournament is uh, is up there, hundred yeah. percent. Well, for the matches that haven't escaped your memory again, because there's been so many, um, what are some of the best atmospheres? I know again I'll relate back to with NGW, Nathan Cruz and Matt Myers, the amount of stuff they did in the city hall with over a thousand people they could tell that story. So for somebody that's play by play and loves to tell that story, what are some of the best um, experiences you've had and matches you've called? I mean, it is, it is about story for me as well. So it's, it's very much about, you know, those, those situations that have history. Like, uh, Kirby and Hendry is a, is a classic example. By the time we were into, you know, 2019 with those guys, you know, we had three years of, of previous just within that one promotion to, to draw on. Um, things like Nathan and Matt, like you said, in NGW is, is great. Nathan, by the way, is one of those guys who's very, very good at like uh, coming to me beforehand and like uh, telling me about what the story of the match is going to be and you know what things to put over. You know, me and him have always had a really good, good rapport, and it's really great when wrestlers take the commentary seriously enough that they want to make sure that you're, you know, that you're clued in on what's happening and putting over the right, the right thing. So yeah, I mean, if I had to pick some, I would go. Um, well, the whole the Pro Wrestling World Cup, all, all of that, especially those five days where we did the, you know, the last sixteen through to the finals, just that whole five day blur was incredible. Um, another what culture one would be a, a bit like doing the Hydro. We did a, a, a show called True Legacy in uh, October of 2016 with me and Jim Cornette commentating, and um, uh, the main event was Kurt Angle against Cody Rhodes, which is you know just phenomenal, and that felt like WrestleMania to me, you know, like sitting at ringside. Uh, with Jim and doing that was was amazing um you know and then there's other things like some of the stuff I did I took a couple of years off actually because I started in 08 and then um you know disappeared in 2011 I went to the US to do my master's degree and so from 2011 to 14 I wasn't uh, involved you know um and I sometimes forget some of the cool stuff I did before the before that gap you know and some of the stuff we did we we uh, I was part of the team that revived the FWA, which um, for those who are newer to British wrestling, you know, FWA was the name in British independent wrestling in the early 2000s, was sort of, uh, is kind of credited with with bringing British wrestling into the 21st century, and it got revived only briefly in the end, it only lasted about a uh, year and a half, but some of the stuff we did there was, you know, really ahead of its time. Um, I mean, there's loads of stuff, like, it's really hard to, really hard to pick, but, um, you know, I've been very lucky, and I've seen seen and met and worked with you know some of the absolutely most talented individuals in wrestling history and it's uh it's been quite a quite a ride so far Thank, thanks dave thanks yeah. i appreciate <laughs> that yeah. um so obviously unfortunately defiant wcpw that had closed down and it was as if it was going to be the end of the tandem between you two again yeah I, I hope so but, <laughs> yeah. but here we are yeah. So yeah. with with that comment, what was your thoughts like? What was your reaction when Gary reached out to you and was like, "Look, wanting you to be part of Wrestle Carnival, and you're going to be doing it with James." Uh, well, he didn't tell me the second part to start with. Uh, you just saw the announcement and thought, yeah. "Oh shit!" He made, me say, he made me say yes on the first part, 
and then uh, and then yeah, and then the second part came later, but when I'd already signed a legally binding contract, unfortunately. But um, but no, I mean Gary Gary's someone I know well. Uh, he's um, he was obviously you know involved in founding Wrestlegate, um, and now he's moving on to a new project in Wrestle Carnival, which should be uh, exciting. Um, he, um, and so yeah, you know I'm always happy to uh, to try out new things. Milton Keynes, where we're doing um, you know a, a show next year, is going to be an interesting. But, you know, we did a, we did a couple of uh, what culture shows there, and the crowds were always great. So, looking forward to that as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just it feels just so weird at the moment because I you know I haven't well this is true of everyone I'm sure I haven't done a live wrestling show um, for I maybe I've done one this year maybe I think maybe I haven't done one since December or at least January. So it's yeah. like uh, at this point it's just like I just want to I just need to be back out there, you know, and and. I, I know so many people involved in the industry, particularly, you know, actual wrestlers who are just like, it is such a part of our, you know, identity. Those of us who, who work in pro wrestling, we love it so much that like, we just, we just cannot wait to be back out there and telling stories. And, and, uh, you know, my role in that obviously is as a commentator and, and I just really want to be doing it. And and so I, I can't wait. Enjoy that, James. He cannot wait to be sat beside you calling commentary. It's That's been a long time coming, and he just can't <laughs> wait until that happens. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. As soon as this this goes live, I'm going to have to find a way to download it or, or, or you know rip it or something like that and loop that little segment over and over and over again. I think that's music to my ears, but seriously, um, I, I just cannot wait to be ringside for, for live wrestling again. Um, it has got to the stage. I think my last show was just before lockdown around maybe a week and a half two weeks something like that um but that's way way too long you know it really is even a month would be way way too long i've grown addicted to this stuff to the point that i put up a tweet um maybe may or something like that where i said that two of the cats back home at my parents house had started fighting and i almost started commentating on that just for a laugh obviously um i don't think any one of them is going to get the belt or get a push or anything like that but you never know um but that that sums it up i miss this stuff so much and as much as dave and i are like an old married couple i am looking forward to sitting there um and just it'll feel like in a weird kind of way this is so cliched and so cheesy to say but it, i think it's true it'll feel like just like there's been no time at all between that last defiant show and this i honestly feel like dave and i have enough chemistry by now that you could just sit us out you could sit us out there and you know you could have two bums fight and we would be able to make magic with it um dave might not want to say that because he doesn't have the same ego as me but i don't care it's true i mean you say i don't have the same ego as you i do still have my, my oh god my commentator of the year award from uh, defiant it's we my have, commentator of the year award. Yeah, well, I, I think we're fine. There was some drama about who was the rightful winner, but I keep this on my desk uh, even even now. So, um, uh, you know, I appreciate you saying I don't have an ego, but I'm not sure it's uh, <laughs> was, was correct. Are you going to be bringing that to the commentary booth? Just oh, so yeah. It's like sat next to you? It's actually surprisingly heavy. So it's actually quite a good paperweight, um, you know, to keep my files in order. So that's the only reason... I'll be bringing it. It's not, I'm not gloating. It's just that it's a practical tool. <laughs> Let's hope he sticks with the uppercuts and not start using that. Well, you know, I have. He's, he's right. It's made of, uh, is it solid gold, Dave? Or yeah. did you just get it painted? I can't, I can't tell. Uh, they told me it's solid gold, yeah. Yeah, I don't want to get hit with that. I'll stick with the uppercuts for now. <laughs> well we'll have to speak to gary and make sure we do get a commentator of the year award again um just to get that rivalry going like see if they can go two and oh or if you can pull one back um four on one so what are your both like thoughts on wrestle carnival then a lot of people you hear it all the time especially with nxt uk when that came in brit rest is dead brit rest is dead it's not it's not dead there has been things going on um with the speaking out movement and people uh Rightfully so, trying to shape and change professional wrestling. You've seen it with Gary and Wrestle Carnival. They've posted um, their standards and what they expect of all of their workers, all of their fans, just to put those safeguarding processes in 
place. But again, Dave, you mentioned you worked with uh, Gary for WrestleGate. What's your thoughts like going forward with Wrestle Carnival, and what are you looking forward to um, being the voices of this new company coming out next year? Well, I mean, I think it's there's the the British wrestling. I mean, the wrestling industry as a whole, but especially the British wrestling industry is going to be very very different you know when when things come back for a couple of reasons you know one is one is that uh the industry like most you know live events industries has been decimated by what happened and there will be some promotions that haven't survived this for for that reason there's also some promotions and promoters who you know whose uh, businesses didn't deserve to survive because of of their their working practices and you know some of the stuff that got called out was long overdue um so I think the ones who are still here or who the new ones who become part of the industry, you know, once we're through this weird period of time um, with the lockdown and everything, the, the ones that thrive will have to be the creative ones, you yeah. know, because um, there are still, despite people saying, oh, British wrestling is dead. That's never been, you know, that was always an exaggeration. There are still, there will still be some established companies who are doing their thing very well. And, you know, if people, People don't want to see a cheap imitation of a, of a independent wrestling company that's already established. They want to see something new. Uh, Gary's, you know, creative guy, and I think the the whole sort of uh, branding and the you know the whole imaging behind Wrestle Carnival is uh, is a really interesting concept. You know, I, I know he's still in the process of, of revealing what that's going to look like in terms of uh, in terms of match types. You know, and who's who's going to be involved. There's a lot of announcements coming out about that all the time the guidelines for talent i think that you mentioned are really important um so i think he's got you know i think him and the whole wrestle carnival team have a have a huge opportunity um to to kind of rise from the ashes of this situation and and there will be a next wave of massive british wrestling promotions and you know it could be that wrestle carnival if it if it does the right things could be could be one of the leading lights there no, definitely. What about yourself, James? I just love the concept. You know, as soon as I heard the name and I saw the logo, it, it just really appealed to me. Um, you know, I'm not alone in this. A lot of people look at professional wrestling like a circus. It's it's a pantomime come to life. Um, it's the best of entertainment, all that sort of stuff. And it truly is. And it is a carnival. So as soon as I saw that, I thought, you know, this is something that I could fit into. Um not only because of the way I dress, uh, which <laughs> is a bit extravagant and, uh, you know, odd, some people might say, namely Dave Bradshaw. I think well, I, uh, I, I, I did hear from Gary that you are responsible for the uh, wardrobe and you will be dressing dear for the first show. Oh, oh. fantastic. Well, oh. yeah, we'll get ready for more sequins than, than the trapeze artist, is I think the way I say <laughs> because, oh my goodness, this man likes some sequins. I certainly do. I love a bit of flash. I love a bit of sequin. Um, and I, I latterly like, um, you know, like leopard print trousers and things like that as well. So I've, I've gone a bit mad with it, but I can't help myself. You know, when you look this good, et cetera, et cetera. But I'll spare you that, that rant. <laughs> um, seriously, though, I'm really looking forward to Wrestle Carnival. I think when you look at um, what Gary has achieved up until now, he's a respected promoter. Um, and he's building a very, very good team of people who not only have been around the block, but are also very passionate about wrestling as well. And I think that's very, very important um, to borrow from a company that I know very well up north again. ICW, you know, didn't get to where it is today um, by surrounding itself by people who, you know, with people who don't care. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this has been a long journey for them. Um, and a very fruitful, successful one. And hopefully, if everything, you need a lot of luck in there as well. But Gary has a really solid foundation here. It's a great name. It's a great logo. I'm sure it'll be a great look come showtime. And as I say, he's building a really good team. I'm excited to be a part of it. Oh, brilliant. And what about the news that came out regarding the ringmasters? And everyone was expecting to be the same old. They're going to bring in all the guys. But Gary's like, actually, nope. We're going to prove that we've got some of the best female wrestlers on the planet and they're going to be showing what British wrestling is all about. What's your thoughts on the Ringmasters um, concept? Me? Um, I mean, I think, as I say, I think the, the, the promotions that are going to survive and thrive in this 
post pandemic world will be the ones that uh, do something different and and they and they have a USP. They have a unique selling point, you know. And I think uh, the Ringmasters concept as a match uh, immediately makes you sit up and take notice. Uh, to to have the debut one of those matches be a women's match, uh, I think is a statement of intent. You know, is to say that is to say that you know what like women's wrestling is going to be a central part of, of what we're doing with Wrestle Carnival. Um, and right from the beginning, you know, our, our signature match, which is one of the first things we've announced, uh, will be a women's, you know, the first one of them will be a women's match. And I think that, that I hope gives people um, some sense of the kind of um, wrestling promotion that Gary and, and Wrestle Carnival uh, plan on being. Yeah, definitely. It's getting away from that token, oh, let's have a women's match. It's proving that they're just as important as everybody else on the show, and rightfully so. Uh, James, what's your thoughts on the concept? Well, on female wrestling, first and foremost, I think you just have to look not only at what's happening in the, the biggest companies around, WWE, AEW, etc., but women's wrestling has been fantastic for a long, long time. You know, you look outside those companies at what was simmering beneath that for years and years in companies like Shimmer, um, over in Japan as well, but specifically over here in the UK, you know, Dave, he'll be able to tell you it'll be night and day compared to when Dave started, I'm sure, to what it is now and the level of talent that are knocking around. Certainly since I started as well, um, there are so many great workers. Um, and it's not just that they're great female workers or they have great women's matches or anything like that. You know, they're having some of the best matches, period, on yeah. wrestling shows up and down the country. Um, and I think it's a really, really cool thing that Wrestle Carnival are willing to showcase that and, and help push things forward again because I think these women deserve it. Yeah, no, 100%. So if, well, Gary will be watching um, and you mentioned there's so much talent, Hi, whether it's male or female. Hi, Gary. <laughs> um, is, is there anybody that's up and coming that you'd specifically like to see given an opportunity in Wrestle Carnival? Well, male or female. Male or female. Or tag um, team. I would say there's a few names that spring to mind um, from our, you know, some of the f female wrestlers we've we've seen, starting with females. I think there's um, um, Mercedes Blaze, who's been big in Frontline, which I've been commentating down in, in London. I've been super impressed with her. Uh, Lizzie Evo, who was competed in uh, Defiant as Lizzie Styles, uh, despite her obnoxious obsession with Liverpool Football Club, uh, <laughs> which, as you can imagine, has been off the scale this That's year. The only downfall of Lizzie. <laughs> oh, my God. I had to mute her on Twitter for about two weeks after Liverpool won the Premier League, but she's great. Um, Millie McKenzie is another one just off the top of my head. I mean, there's there's so many, uh, and they're, they're you know, maybe some of the more known names, but there's there's you know constantly people coming through because actually, like the more other young women see women's wrestlers uh, being given that platform, the more of them want to then start training. You know, so one of the problems, to be fair to promoters, you know, one of the problems in earlier years was that a, the, a large majority of people who trained to be wrestlers were male because so many women didn't think it was, you know, a thing for them. Whereas, um, you know, those numbers are starting to to rise now, and so there's a bigger pool of, of talent. Um, in terms of male wrestlers, I would say uh, up up and coming wise, people who you might not have heard of, um, MGW has uh, Miles Kamen. Uh, who's uh, exceptional young talent, equally obnoxious, has to be said, uh, <laughs> as as Lizzie is. Um, there's a whole you know group of talent from um, from down in you know in, in the London area. There's a n number of schools, and there's a London school of lucha libre and uh, knuckle locks and, and various others who have produced all kinds of guys. You know, OJMO came from um, knuckle locks. There's um, uh, Callum Newman, uh, who's one of the most impressive you know high flyers I think we've seen. In British wrestling for a long time, so I mean, I, I, I mean, already by naming people, I've left people out, so I, I apologise. But there's, you know, again, this idea that British wrestling is dead is fundamentally laughable. Like there, there will be a huge pool of talent, and not only are there, is there a huge pool of talent, but there's a huge pool of talent who are desperate to get in the ring and entertain because it's been so long since we've been able to, you know, since we've been able to get out there and and do what we do. So I do think there will be. Uh, that first show will be will be quite something. No, definitely. What about yourself, James? Especially like maybe up in Scotland. 
Yeah, well, you know, a lot of Scottish people are going to hate me for this, but I'm going to pick an English guy first. Um, <laughs> he's a, an English guy who lives up here, and he actually he moved up here when he was very young. Um, I'm on about a wrestler called Leighton Buzzard, if you've heard of him. Yeah. Um, incredibly talented. Um, just had excellent matches with everyone in ICW. Um, last summer, it was a big breakout summer for Leighton Buzzard. He had excellent back-to-back -back matches against Joe Hendry on night one of a, a, a pay-per-view we did. And then on night two, he faced James Storm as well. Wow. And, and James Storm was singing his praises afterwards as well to anyone who would listen. So he has a very bright future ahead of him. Um, he's a very good talker as well, very confident. Um, and I love a good promo. I actually think that th there aren't enough great promos around now. Um, a lot of focus has went on actual in-ring talent, which is great, but I, I would like to see more balance. So it's it's genuinely awesome to see someone who can talk and wrestle as well and has a character. He does this very excellent pirate-themed captain gimmick in ICW as well. Um, on the female side of things, I'm going to have to, you know, as much as it sickens me to do this, I'm going to agree with Dave again um, and say that uh, Lizzie Evo, who wrestled as Lizzie Styles, I was so impressed by her character work in Defiant Wrestling. Um, towards the end of that promotion, she was a real highlight across the board. Um, and I genuinely believe you could have put her in a really high position on one of those cards um, and no one would have blinked. And again, it goes back to this whole thing about... Um, People don't think that women's matches headline shows enough. Women like her, who have characters like she does and are improving like she is inside the ring all the time, no one can tell me that there won't come a day where they're not headlining shows, um, and deservedly so. I was, again, so impressed by what she achieved in such a short space of time in Defiant Wrestling. So I would love to see someone like her involved in Wrestle Carnival. Um, there are so many other options as well. We could be here all day. Because back to Dave's earlier point, the talent pool, you know, contrary to what a lot of critics on social media would have you believe, the talent pool is is really big um, in the UK. There are, there are so many deserving men and women, and a lot of young men and women as well. And they've, they've uh, benefited from the platform that guys like Rampage Brown, Nathan Cruz, um, Lionheart, who we spoke about earlier, Wolfgang, etc., up here and um, all these guys have built this platform for these young men and women to really go and smash it now and that's exactly what they're doing so i for one believe the future is bright but yeah i would love to see love to see uh people like lizzie and leighton in wrestle carnival that would be a real thrill nah well gary you you know who they want now so get by the way work. we have no inside it none of those names we've said we don't have any inside information either. there may have oh. been no conversations at all so don't get like overexcited as if you know this is by us saying this this is wrestle carnival dropping any hints it certainly isn't <laughs> <laughs> no it's completely like who you'd like um to see but gents again thank you for coming on the show um and again looking forward to seeing you both behind the booth together again your chemistry is one of the reasons why um personally you're my favorite duo in the uk or thank you especially one of the throughout the world anyways to be honest and that's not me just saying it one of the things with Defiant and WCPW was the chemistry between you both. There'll be times where I'll just be laughing at you both, bickering like that old married couple. But then, <laughs> again, like you said, especially with like the Martin Kirby stuff, you add to that match. And I'm looking forward to seeing the concept from Wrestle Carnival as well and seeing you both work your magic on that. And, of course, Dave dressed like yourself. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you what's not going to happen. I'm not dressing like Dave. <laughs> I refuse to look like I'm going to a funeral. No way. It's yeah. a party whenever I'm around, I'm afraid. You could have talked with my style. style. You yeah. wouldn't be able to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, leave that one alone. Let's show him up. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, we'll start with you. Where can people like find more of your work? Where can they find you on social media? I have a website now. I learned to use WordPress. Uh, which you know that's a, it's a skill uh, Dave Bradshaw TV for that you can find me uh, on Twitter at Dave Bradshaw and Facebook and Instagram I'm at Dave Bradshaw 83 fantastic and James um, if you want to follow me on Twitter which I'm sure Dave would tell you is a very bad idea um, if, if you want to and you should 
If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Top Class Kennedy. It's the exact same for Instagram as well. I'm very guilty of not using Facebook enough. Um, I think my profile picture for my, my page on there is from like 2016 or something like that. <laughs> so it's, it's really old school and doesn't get updated enough. I might need to sort that. Um, if you want uh, more of me, for lack of a better phrase, um, check out ICW as well. And of course, cannot wait to get started with Wrestle Carnival as well. I'm, honestly, I, it might sound cliche to say, but I'm already looking forward to next year. I cannot wait for it. I'm so excited about this. I'm excited about working with Dave. I'm excited about working more with yourself. I'm excited about working with Gary. I'm just excited about the concept full stop. Yeah. It's going to be great. No, it's going to be fantastic. And again, if you're not following already, make sure you subscribe. Again, this will be one of the first uh, videos for Wrestle Carnival YouTube. You can find them on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Just type in Wrestle Carnival. Uh, you'll be able to find all the upcoming announcements on where they're going to be based, who's going to be part of the roster. And again, if you want to follow myself or my personal stuff, uh, you can follow the show at K. Johansson Show. Um, and again, one of the first imports that Gary brought over, I'll be having an interview with El Messias and then re-releasing as his Milton Huertes persona. And that's coming to the K. Johansson Show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Until next time.